presentation. So, uh, without further ado, let's hand over to Miles. Um, Miles Thomas is a well-known uh, media producer, runs a company called Very Nice Productions, and as I said, um, he's also served as chair of the uh, Better Public Media Trust. For, so, for the David Beetson Memorial Lecture, please give Miles a very warm welcome. Thank you. Kia ora koutou. Ko nga pui toku iwi, ko nati manu toku hapu, ko karatu toku marae, ko Miles Thomas toku ingoa. I grew up with David Beetson. He was on telly and I was in bed with my parents watching him as he was a newsreader on Eyewitness News and various uh, programs like that. But I came to work with him uh, as, uh, when we worked together on Save TV Dead 7 and also the campaign to uh, uh, to, uh, to save uh, regional TV stations. Um, the, and the BPM honours David each year with our memorial address because his fight for non-commercial television was an honourable one. He wasn't doing it for himself. He wasn't doing it so he could get a job or so that he was stood to benefit in any way other than because uh, public media is good for Aotearoa New Zealand. Like us at Better Public Media, he recognised the benefits to our country from locally produced public media. David knew from a long career in media, he was uh, editor at The Listener and Jim Bolger's press secretary, amongst many roles, that New Zealand's media plays an important role in our nation's culture, social cohesion and democracy. I'll talk about culture first. Culture is very important. New Zealand culture is unique and special, yet it has always been at risk of being swamped by content from overseas. The US, especially with its crackpot conspiracies, uh, extreme racial tensions and tensions, just tensions in general. The, the antidote to this is local content. It reflects us, it portrays us, it defines New Zealand and whether we like it or not, it defines us. But it's important to remember that what we see reflected back to us comes through a filter. This speech, for example, is coming to you through a filter called Miles Thomas. Commercial news reflects our world through a filter of sensation and danger to hold uh, people's attention. That makes New Zealand seem more shallow, greedy, fearful and dangerous. The social media filter makes the world seem more angry. RNZ's filter is um, probably thoughtful, a bit smug, middle class. Uh, the, the New Zealand Herald filter makes us think every dairy is being ram raided every night. And the spin-off filter suggests New Zealand is hip, urban and mildly infatuated with Winston Peters. These cultural reflections are very important actually because they influence how we see New Zealand and its people. And that makes content, cultural content, very special. It's not a commodity. It's not a milk powder, you know. We don't drink milk and think about flooding in Queenstown. We don't drink milk and have a laugh about the Kiwi accent. We don't drink milk and identify with a young family living in poverty. Local content is rich and powerful and important to our society. And when government supports local media production industry, it is actually supporting the audiences and our culture. Whether it's Te Maungai Paho or New Zealand On Air or the Film Commission and the Screen Production Rebate, these organisations fund New Zealand's identity and culture and success. Don't ask Treasury how to fund culture. Accountants don't understand it. They can't count it and put it in a spreadsheet like they can milk solids. Of course, they'll say such subsidies or rebates distort the market. That's the whole point. The market doesn't work. Moreover, public funding of films and other content fosters a more stable long-term industry rather than trashy short-termism that is completely vulnerable to outside pressures like the US writer's strike. We have a celebrated content production industry. Our films, video, audio, games, etc. More local content brings stability to this industry, which, by the way, also brings money into the country and fosters tourism. New Zealand needs more local content. And what's more, it needs to be accessible to audiences on the platform that they use. But in New Zealand, we do have one small problem. Unlike Australia, we can't use a quota because our GATT agreement does not include a carve-out for local musical media quotas. In the 90s, when GATT was being nego negotiated, 
Aussies, uh, the Aussies added an exception to their GATT agreement so that they could have music quotas and content quotas. Um, and that means they have a, a quota on radio stations for about 40% of Australian content, I think it is. And they also have the option now of introducing a Netflix quota, which, will, uh, which is proposed to uh, take 20% of all revenue regenerated, oh no, to require 20% of all uh, programming on Netflix be Australian. Imagine that here in New Zealand. We can't do that, unfortunately, because New Zealand's, uh, because in the 90s our Bolger government and in fact decided against putting that same exception into our GATT agreement. But there is another way of doing it. And I will, uh, if we take a lead from Denmark and, and many other states, which I'll get to in a minute. The second important benefit of locally produced public media is social cohesion. How society works, the peace and harmony and respect that we show each other in public. And that depends heavily on the public sphere, of which media is a big part. Extensive research in Europe and North America shows the power of media to polarise society, which can lead to misunderstanding, mistrust and hatred. But media can also strengthen social cohesion, particularly for minority communities. And that same research showed that public media, otherwise known as public service, media is widely regarded to be an important contributor to tolerance in society, promoting social cohesion and integrating all communities and generations. The third benefit is democracy, very topical at the moment. I've already touched on how news media affects our culture, but more directly news media influences the public dialogue over issues of the day. It defines that dialogue and really it, it is that dialogue. So if our news media is shallow and vacuous, ignoring policies, focusing on the polls and the horse race, then politicians who want to be elected tailor their messages accordingly, right guys? There's plenty of examples of this, as National's boot camp policy attests, or Labor's removing GST on food. As policies, neither is effective, but in the simplified 30 seconds of commercial news and headlines, these policies resonate. Is that a good thing that policies that are known to fail are nonetheless followed because our news media cater to our base instincts and short attention spans? In my view, commercial media is actually a disaster for democracy all over the world. But of course, we can't control commercial media. No one's suggesting that, okay, if anyone's watching out there. We're not suggesting that we we're not, we're not a dictatorship, but what we can do, the only rational thing we can do, is to provide st stronger, locally produced public media. And unfortunately, New Zealand lacks public media. Obviously, Australia, the UK, Canada have more public media than us. They have more pub people and they can afford it. But what about countries our size? Perhaps Ireland, smaller population, much more public media. Denmark, Norway, Finland, all with roughly five million people all have significantly better public media than us. Even after the recent increases, thank you, Minister Jackson, New Zealand still spends just $44 per person on public media. It's less than half of those other countries I mentioned. When we had a licence fee, we spent $110. Jim Bolger's government got rid of that and replaced it with funding from general taxation, which means every year the Minister of Finance, working closely with Treasury, decides how much to spend on public media for the year. It's what I call the curse of annual funding because it makes fund funding public media a very political decision. National, let's be honest, the National Party hates public media. Maybe because they get nicer treatment on commercial news. We see this around the world, the Daily Mail, Sky News in Australia, News Talk ZB here. Most commercial media, not all, but most quite openly favours the right. This is a systemic bias because right-wing media just gets more clicks. Right-wing politicians are quite happy about that, surprise, surprise. Why fund public media to get in the way, even if it benefits our culture, social cohesion, democracy, etc. And New Zealand is the same. The last national government froze RNZ funding for nine years. Melissa Lee fought against the ANZ PM merger. Now she's fighting against the news bargaining bill. As minister, she could cut RNZ and New Zealand on his budget, but it wouldn't be just cost-cutting it would actually be political interference in our news media, an attempt to skew the national conversation in favour of the National Party by favouring commercial media. So, Aotearoa New Zealand needs two things. 
more money to be spent on public media and less control by the politicians. Sustainable funding, basically. And the best way to achieve it is a media levy. For those who don't know, a levy is a tax that is highly targeted, and we have a lot of them, like the Telecommunications Development Levy, or TDL, which currently gathers 10 million a year from internet service providers like Spark and Two Degrees, and it pays for rural broadband. We're all paying for the better internet for farmers, basically. When first introduced by the previous national government, it collected $50 million, but it has dropped down a bit lately. It could go back up. This is one of many levies that we live with, and actually, we barely notice them. Like the levy we pay on our insurance to cover the earthquake commission and the fire emergency levy, there are maritime levies and en energy levies to fund Ika and Waka Kotahi. Uh, there's a levy for building consents for MB. A levy on advertising pays for the ASA. A levy uh, is funded, funds the Broadcasting Standards Authority. Lots of levies, they're very effective. So, who could the media levy, levy. ISPs like the TDL, sure. Raise the TDL back up to 50 million or perhaps higher and it only adds a dollar to everyone's internet bill. There's 50 million dollars right there. But the real target should be big tech. Social media and large streaming services. I'm talking about, obviously, Facebook, Google, Netflix, YouTube, so on. These are the companies that have really profited from the advent of online media and at the expense of locally produced public media. We need to get a way to get these. We need a way to get these companies to make or at least fund content creation here in Aotearoa. Denmark recently proposed a solution to this problem with an innovative levy of 2% on revenue of streaming services like Netflix, Amazon, Prime, and Disney. But that 2% rises to 5% if that streaming company doesn't spend at least 5% of their revenue in Denmark, revenue collected in Denmark, in Denmark. Denmark joins many other European countries already doing this. Germany, Poland, Spain, Italy, the Netherlands, France, and even Romania, all about to levy the streamers to fund local production. And Australia is thinking of doing it too. But that's just the online streaming companies. There's also social media. There's also search engines, which contribute nothing and take almost all the commercial revenue. The Fair Digital News Bargaining Bill will address that to a degree. But it's not open, and we don't know if the amounts that they negotiate are fair. Another problem is that it's only for news publishers. Drama and comedy producers uh, don't, don't get a look in. Not, neither does on-demand video, nor documentary makers or podcasters. Social media and search engines frequently feature and put advertising around these forms of content and hoover up the digital advertising that would otherwise fund them. So they should also contribute. A media levy can best be seen as a levy on those companies that benefit from media on the internet, but don't contribute to the public benefits of media, culture, social cohesion, and democracy. And that's why the media levy can include internet service providers and large companies that sell digital advertising and subscriptions. Please note, uh, a, a media levy would not target smaller companies if it's onerous on their uh, two owners for them to be afford. But that's what all levies do. They have a starting point in which they kick in. The huge benefit of a levy is that it is separate from the annual budget. So it's fiscally neutral and, it, and politicians can't get their mitts on it. It removes the curse of annual funding. It creates a funding stream derived from the actual commercial media activities which provide the distribution gaps in the first place for which public media compensates. And that's why the proceeds would go to the non-commercial platform and the funding agencies, to Maangai Paho, New Zealand On Air, and the Film Commission. One final point, this wouldn't conflict with the new digital services tax either proposed by the government, because that's a replacement for income tax. A media levy, like all levies, sits over and above income tax. So there we go, that's our proposal. I've mentioned Jim Bolger three times. I've also outlined some quite straightforward methods to fund public media sustainably and to fund a significant increase in local content production. Film, video, audio, journalism, and whatever comes next. None of it needs to be within the grasp of Melissa Lee, or Willie Jackson, or David Seymour, or Winston Peters. All of it can be used to create local content that improves democracy, social cohesion, 
and culture. Thank you. Push for time, so to keep us on schedule, I think we'll move the questions to the main session. So we're, we're going to go straight to the main event, which is our, our three key speakers. Um, I'll introduce them in turn. Um, I think that they'll speak for about five minutes each, um, and we'll let all the speakers go before we open up the debate to questions. Um, when we're asking questions, please, please don't go on a five-minute rant. Please keep things quite short and pointed and preferably uh, aimed at an actual question that our uh, speakers can respond to. If you're uh, feeling the need for sustenance and caffeine, we also have a, a kitchen at the back and there's tea and coffee, so feel free to go and help yourselves at any moment. So, if you're on Zoom and you have a question, then you can put a, a question in the text and that will get picked up and my erstwhile colleague David will wave furiously at me when it's time to ask it. So, first up we have the Honourable Willie Jackson. Very pleased you could meet with us here tonight, Minister. Obviously he's the Minister for Broadcasting and Media, also Murray Development. He's also Associate Minister for ACC, Housing, Social Development and Employment. Uh, Willie has significant working experience both within the Māori community and the mainstream media in print, radio and television. He first became an MP in 1999 for the uh, Mana Motahake Party as part of the Alliance. He was previously also Deputy Leader of the Alliance and played a key role in the formation of an earlier version of the Māori Party. He returned to, to Parliament as an MP with Labour in 2017. He's been a trade union organiser, a record company executive, a broadcaster, radio host, and held multiple roles as a Māori advocate, including being chair for the Iwi radio station network, uh, Te Whakaruru Hau O Te Reo Irirangi Māori. So a very, very warm welcome to you, Willie Jackson. <laughs> yeah, please. Peter, can I just get a word in um, before the minister starts? Just an encouragement for you all to use the microphone, because that's going to help. Everyone is. That's better for them, yeah. You can use this one or go to this one. This one? Okay. That, that's, yeah. that's fine. Thanks. Uh, I so can hear on online. Okay. Yeah. Kia ora. Kia ora, Peter. Uh, kia ora, Tato. He honna re nui ki tahara mai wainga nui e koutou. Uh, ki te tautoko te kaupapa tino a tā hue i tēnei pō. Uh, nō reira, uh, Peter, Miles, i mihana ki a kōrua i whakaranga tira a mātou i tēnei wā. Uh, tēnā kōrua, tēnā nō tātou kato. Lovely to uh, come along to support this kaupapa, and uh, geez, I enjoyed that. Miles, I actually agreed with everything. Yeah, <laughs> it, yeah, it's terrific, terrific quarter. Uh, shame you couldn't have supported me more before the merger, but never mind. We won't. Uh, you supported me enough. You supported me enough. Thank you, Miles. Thank you. Yeah. But uh, no, well, I think um, what Miles talked about. I was listening, and and he, and he ticked all the boxes, didn't he? Because it's all about identity. That's what drove us in terms of the merger. And I was thinking about David Beetson, and I think one of his, that was one of his dreams, wasn't it, in terms of putting the merger together. And so I was, you know, I was just obviously disappointed when we folded the merger in. But uh, what was driving that merger and underpinning that merger was everything that Miles talked about. You know, what is the New Zealand voice? What is the New Zealand identity? And I, and I said this in the newspaper, is it just about country calendar, which I love, but it's got to be more than that, because Grey Lynn is a stunning example of the diversity of the New Zealand identity, you know? And is that reflected? Is Grey Lynn reflected in our New Zealand public broadcasters? I don't think so. I think you're going a bit far calling uh, RNZ smug there, Miles. I put a lot of money into RNZ, so, uh, you know, I might have to talk to Helen Clark uh, to talk to her about that sort of court at all. But, but I think the challenge for us is to come up with a cohesive coordinated, comprehensive uh, broadcasting strategy that reflects the whole country. That was what underpinned the merger, no doubt about it. When the merger fell over, we had to come up with something else. And I think in the last seven or eight months, you know, we've got the frameworks in place. You know, the, the initial investment in terms of RNZ, which was starved of, of money for 10 years. Ten years they were starved of money. Of money. No wonder Melissa Lee didn't come here. If she had a heard you, Miles, she would have run out the door, I think, you know, after that type of quarter. But, you know, she don't come here because they know what they did. They froze RNZ funding for ten years. They couldn't do anything. 
So I, I think that after the merger fell over, I had a look at things and I thought we've got to get at least the frameworks in place in terms of a broadcasting policy. And getting 25 million extra a year into RNZ was the start of that. Gave them an opportunity in telling a New Zealand story. New Zealand story is not just one story, it's about the Māori story, it's about the Pacific story, it's about the ethnic story. And I'm hoping RNZ can, can go down that track a bit and, and, and get a better national, get a, get a, give them an opportunity to maybe do what they were doing some years back. They haven't had that opportunity. We've changed the board in terms of TVNZ. I think you've seen that. Why? Because we want to reflect what we want, which is we want a strong public broadcaster. And with respect to TVNZ, and you know, I've got some mates up there in relations, you know, I think there's more of an emphasis on Trevor, uh, Treasure Island and, and reality shows than the local, local programming. Then a show about Grey Lynn, a show about Māori people, Pacifica people. We've got, a, we've got a, a board in place. I'm really proud of that board we've got in place because they know their obligations in terms of public board broadcasting. In terms of the digital bargaining bill, it gives, it'll give the little player a chance. Yeah, it doesn't do everything, Miles, but I think it'll give, it'll give the, the news producers a chance um, uh, uh, to actually get some compensation because they've been ripped off by these global giants. They've been ripped off and, 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 and I've had so many people come to my office and, and ask for us to do something. So I was proud to get that up along with Helen White here. It's good to see Helen here tonight too, your local uh, MP. We were proud to put that digital bargaining bill up. We got a first reading out. Sadly, I think it'd be thrown out if we're not the, not the government come, ne uh, come next time. I don't get where the Nats are coming from. Why, why wouldn't you have a digital bargaining bill that'll look after um, the little players in New Plymouth and in Vicargill, whose news just gets taken and they don't get one cent back? Not one cent back. You know, we have half the... Mark Jennings here tonight, he knows better than anyone. We've got half the journalists that we had uh, uh, now than we had 10 years ago. Huge amount of good journos who've all gone out the door, all gone out the door because these big companies come in, take everything and don't give anything back. If we get this bill through, we'll get a couple of hundred million bucks coming back into the, into the market and I think it will help us in terms of a susta a sustaining jobs and everything else. However, what Miles said is right. There's never been enough money put into broadcasting. It's, it's never been a priority. Let's be frank. Um, we try, not, Labor tried with Helen. National comes in, and it's just not a priority. When we talked about the merger, why would you put so much money into that? What a waste of time. They don't see it as an integral part of democracy. We, we know how important it is. We know how important our stories are. We know how important it is to reflect our identity. So I'm proud we've got a, a TVNZ board up, we've got a digital bargaining bill up, we've got major events, investment into Radio New Zealand, we've got in, a huge investment now into Māori broadcasting while well, over the last two or three years. Um, we've put 90 to 100 million in and that Māori broadcasting should be reflected in terms of mainstream. So the framework and the position's in place, but, but I fear for our future because, as Miles said, you know, the funding is really dependent each year on who your broadcasting minister is, because that minister, like I do in Māori development and, I, and I've had to do in broadcasting, has to go up to the Minister of Finance, has to work with Treasury in terms of pulling resources back. And we do have to come up with a model uh, that is... Uh, more effective and, and, and more reflective of, of, of the broadcasting of broadcasting in this country. And that's why when, when he talks about what he talked about in terms of a fee is something that we should be considering. So I take what he said really well. And, and, uh, and you know, the, 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 you know, otherwise we're just at the whim of politicians, of, of, of no, nothing against Graham Robinson, who's the best Minister of Finance you could come across, but it's a, oh, it's not a priority this year. No, we've got a cost of living crisis, which we have, but broadcasting is such an integral part of our New Zealand democracy. And, and if we just leave it to the big global players, um, we're in trouble. And I, I'm worried about the future, but I make a commitment that I will continue uh, with that work that is in place, that foundation's in place, but also explore new strategies and, and, and uh, look at the type of 
a strategy that, that Miles talked about because I think that's we've got to have something new, we've got to have something different, and broadcasting is so incredibly important in reflecting our country's identity. Kia ora tato katoa. Minister Willie Jackson. Uh, so next up we have Ricardo Menendez March from the Green Party. He's been a Green MP since 2020 as a spokesperson on a number of portfolios including health, immigration, rainbow communities, uh, social development and commerce. Uh, he was formerly a co-convener of the Young Greens of Aotearoa, New Zealand 2016 and first stood for Parliament for the Greens in 2017. His media experience includes I believe working as a film projectionist uh, before going into politics. Um, Ricardo was born in Tijuana, Mexico, and he has experience of migrant advocacy work as community organiser and educator on poverty issues. So a very, very warm welcome to Ricardo. Thank you so much. Um, kia ora koutou. Really um, nice to join you tonight and just want to acknowledge the advocacy that you do to ensure that we have a strong, independent, publicly owned and securely funded public media, something that the Green Party proudly supports. And I just want to say that we welcome um, the additional funding that the government has provided to public media, but we know, as in the previous quarter, though, that there is more we need to do to ensure that that security of funding isn't at the mercy of um, the government of today. And just want to put it on the record, um, the Green Party is very much open to the idea of having a levy to create that a partisan um, funding stream. And, and I think particularly for um, our community and student media, I think that will also be really, really important. And I want to pay a shout out, actually, as somebody who comes from a migrant community, to the important work that our community media and radio stations play, particularly when disaster strikes. I think um, to what Miles was talking about in terms of the different incentives, target groups, and what drives commercial media versus um, public media. Um, I saw it during the pandemic and the floods, how those community radio stations tried to mobilize to actually center the voices of specific communities that otherwise would have not reached uh, been reached by commercial media because there was no incentive for commercial media to center those communities that may be small, but would, would have been left out of the mainstream messages in terms of, for example, how to access um, support, how to access um, vaccination and other um, public key public health messages. And so having that security of funding is key to having also a diversity of voices, which in and of itself strengthens our democracy, strengthens social cohesion, and I was really, and I've been really disappointed, um, and I probably will join on the pylon on the National Party, but I've been really disappointed um, at how we were not able to, for multiple reasons, get the merger across. But I think the opposition um, from the National Party, which was very, very centered actually on dog whistle politics, was really unhelpful. And equally, when we talk about um, strengthening our Maori media, I saw how Melissa Lee prefer to actually pit our migrant uh, community uh, radio stations, for example, against Māori media. And actually, that I thought that was a disservice actually to A, our territory commitments to adequately fund Māori media, but B, that no one wins when we pit groups that are under-resourced and underfunded. That actually, it's not an either or. We can have the revenue streams to secure decent funding for all levels of community and public media. So I think that's something the Green Party can do. That's something the Green Party will continue advocating for and fighting for. Um, we do think the new legislation that is coming across that will enable better bargaining will be a step in the right direction. But we do um, echo the sentiments that actually we need a range of um, media that isn't just news media. Um, and there is, um, particularly with the rise of um, podcast, for example, becoming more and more popular, I think ensuring that those local voices ha can have access to secure funding is important because I've seen the dangers of how a younger generation is growing consuming American commercial media, many, many of it, like with Andrew Tate and others, which is grounded on misogyny and white supremacy that doesn't reflect our own experiences and actually people in Aotearoa deserve to have access to those local voices. 
And finally, while we fight for an apartisan form of funding, for example, could be a levy or something else, I think we can't escape the fact that without tax reform on the agenda, those governments of today will nonetheless be restrained by very, very limited revenue sources to adequately fund our public services, which includes public media. And this is why the Greens will continue fighting for tax reform so that while we work to have a more a partisan form of funding, um, that we, ha we don't use the um, excuses of a tight economic situation to then restrain funding for public media and other public services, as is already happening in the mainstream discourse. And funnily enough, commercial media echo sometimes <laughs> those same arguments. Um, so having um, that revenue stream in the form of tax reform will be also really the key to funding our public services, and the Greens will put that at the top of our agenda in any future government. Kia ora. <laughs> Okay. Um, thank you very much, Ricardo. So we'll move on to Jenny Marcroft from New Zealand First. Uh, Jenny's got a very experienced background in broadcasting. She had over 30 years uh, in, in the industry, including working for uh, independent radio news and TV3. She was a member of parliament in the New Zealand First caucus from 2017 to 2020. And she's New Zealand First spokesperson on the ACC, Arts, Culture and Heritage, Broadcasting, obviously, Communication, IT, Conservation, Environment, Health and Human Rights. Um, she also served on the Parliamentary Health and Environment Select Committee. She's recently worked for a primary health organisation, uh, also returned uh, to the Media Works newsroom and also worked for the Auckland Mayor's Office. Um, so she was very, very busy in between stints in politics. So uh, please give Jenny a very, very warm welcome. <laughs> Oh, good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for coming out on this coolish evening. Uh, it's, a, it's wonderful to be here, and I really appreciate uh, the invitation. Uh, thank you, Peter and Miles. Um, you know, it's been three years since I've been in Parliament, and in that time, uh, I wanted, when I left Parliament, uh, one of the reasons I left New Zealand first was because I wanted to tap back into the media. And so I was able, to, after a period of time, to go back and work uh, in Media Works' new newsroom. Uh, that they set up the t Today FM News. And it was a, a little snapshot of the state of news. And it really had declined in the period of time I'd been away, when I'd been working in Parliament. It was also part of the reason why I left um, working in the media and went off um, and sought a political career, because I felt really strongly that the decline in our media uh, the decline in trust in our media, particularly in our news media, was really be going to become fundamental in the decline of our democracy. So it was something I took passionately to, to Parliament. Um, and it's something I'd also like to continue to do uh, if I'm able to be returned to Parliament uh, at, at this election with New Zealand First. Um, I'd like to acknowledge, Willie, and the work that you have been doing in the public media space. Um, some of the things you've been doing aligns actually with New Zealand First Policy. You may be interested to know that. Um, I believe that um, he's actually done a good job, pretty good job, and it was just a real shame. He had three weeks to go. He could have got that, that merger through, but uh, the rug was pulled out from under, underneath him. However, that's yesterday's story. Today's story is what are we going to do? What are we going to do to ensure that our democracy remains robust and we have uh, a flourishing media to enable, uh, we have that pillar to enable democracy to stand? Because as that pillar of uh, the fourth estate crumbles, so will our democracy and that's something that should be a concern for everybody. We know that recent technological and cultural changes have disrupted our traditional media business the business model we know is crumbling. There's multiple reasons for that, not, not just the fact that we've these, got these global giants sucking out the advertising revenue that they've been doing for a number of years, and it's leaving those media industries at a point where they can't fund their newsrooms. You know, they have had to put younger journalists into their new newsrooms because they're cheaper. The, the experience has, has predominantly left those newsrooms. Um, and also, too, at, with the with the declining trust of the public in our media, uh, 
that, that's really another big issue of concern. So there's a few reasons I believe that our media is in a state that it really do, is something that um, the next government must take a good look at. Uh, so it's that declining revenue, that reduction of investment in journalism, and there are a couple of ways that New Zealand First would like to tackle that. So for example, we've got a workforce development policy uh, in media. We would like, um, if we're in that position after the 14th of October, we would like to have a collaboration with uh, newsrooms uh, to have a 50-50 funding system for a two-year internship for journalism students and media students coming out of uh, Juno schools so that they can have that time, not just being uh, interns and cadet, cadets, but actually have that range of students spread around the country so we have a regional um, spread of those students going out because we know it takes longer than one year to train up a newly trained journalist to actually be effective and functioning inside a newsroom. So giving two years of that 50-50 collaboration with the news uh, entity will enable them to get greater value out of their, their new interns. So alongside that, thank you very much. Uh, uh, we also want to continue supporting other workforce development training programs like the Local Democracy Reporting and Territor to ensure that we have that continuing emerging pipeline of media talent. But something else I think we also need to do is our journalism training schools, they need to ensure through their five-year strategic plan actually to show how they're giving life to providing diverse talent pipelines for the media sector. Now I think that's really important because currently what we're seeing, and, and I'll put my hand up, my daughter's one of them, uh, she's just done her um, three-year degree in communications, you know, she's, she's a young, middle-class, you know, lovely blonde girl, everyone in her class looked exactly like her. We need more diverse students coming through so that they then represent the voice of our people as well. So I think that's something the training institutions actually need to do in their uh, strategic plan. Yeah. Uh, something else I think that's overdue, and I know uh, the Minister's probably actually started work on this, the Broadca Broadcasting Act 1989 needs complete overhaul. Something that New Zealand First would be really interested in doing is actually legislate for a new Public Media Act. And what that means is bringing the uh, Broadcasting Act along with the Radio Communications Act and the Māori Television Service Act in under the one umbrella. However, the thing to note there most importantly is that the specific language component on the Māori Television Act must be maintained. Okay, something else that is really important, uh, and this is something that uh, Mark Jennings may be interested in uh, with Newsroom, is that we, New Zealand First would be very keen to examine tax deductions for domestic news subscription, press patron subscriptions, and large corporate sponsorships of news outlets. We think that's one way that we can help support the industry to help themselves. We know that the Public Interest Journalism Fund became weaponised, $55 million that Minister Jackson put into that. And although I know that he was trying to help support journalism, it, the industry did not sell it very well and it became weaponised. We stopped it when New Zealand First was in government with Labour because uh, the minister at the time wanted it to go out eight weeks before the election and we said that will be used as a bribe for the media, that's how it will go. So we said, no, you can't have that. So there are other ways that we need to support them. Uh, New Zealand First also is very concerned uh, about the global techs um, and we very much would like to look at Minister Jackson's legislation um, around ensuring that we return that, pa that power, current power imbalance that we've got between the publishers and the platforms. So the um, digital bargaining uh, bill at the moment, we'd certainly look at, like to look at that and where we can perhaps even strengthen it. You can clap now, Minister. <laughs> so, you know, if there is a national government, if New Zealand First is there, <laughs> we would certainly like to look at that piece of legislation. Uh, something else that's 
I think really important, it hasn't really been touched on too much this evening, uh, is that regionally there is a way I think that we can support um, our local regional newsrooms, whether it's iwi radio, community radio, and I do acknowledge, Minister, that you've put money into Access Radio and plenty of money into iwi radio, but we believe that they are really important community hubs that could be developing not just new talent coming through, but also the critical role that they play, particularly as we have more and more uh, adverse weather, we've seen the role of the Hawke's Bay radio stations in particular. So having this sort of community regional hub of, of news, using community newspaper as well, supporting that, I think that's a great way that we can develop and strengthen our regional newsrooms so that they can also feed back into a larger, more national news as well, but certainly maintaining uh, a regional news focus is very important. Just very briefly, a couple of other things that um, I'm interested in. I do have a whole suite of policy. I won't read them all out right now, uh, but we are very concerned about media bias. Um, and we think that it's, that is part of the way uh, the Fourth Estate has been corroded, and I think it needs to be addressed. It has a chilling effect, in fact, on free speech. Media bias does shut down debate by making people less likely or less inclined to think for themselves. It's really important that our news stories have balance and are fair and pre present not just one opinion, but have multiple... Um, opinion uh, angles on them so that people can make up their own mind. It's really important that we, we are not dictating to the public. We need to allow them to make up their own mind. So it's really important that we do that. So New Zealand First has a couple of ideas that we'd like to bring to Parliament uh, if we are returned there on the 14th party vote, New Zealand First, it's just better drop that in. Uh, a Royal Commission of Inquiry into Media Bias and Manipulation in New Zealand, we'd like to do that. And also what we'd like to do is we'd like to replace the BSA, the Broadcasting Standards Authority, and establish the role of a media ombudsman. So those are some of our policies which we are just announcing, um, and thank you very much for your time. Well, thanks very much to Jenny and indeed all our speakers for those extremely informative expositions of their respective party values on public media. Um, so uh, now maybe the most important bit of the evening is uh, we turn to the uh, community uh, for who are actually the, the main constituents of this debate and that is the public, uh, hence better public media. So uh, we have uh, some Zoom contingents so who will be uh, putting questions through Zoom chat. Uh, but we'll turn first to the audience here in person. Uh, do any of you have questions you'd like to put to the panel? Um, the gentleman over here and then, uh, then over on the, uh, on the right. Um, EWI Radio were established under treaty settlement, so we believe that, and actually I do have a background in EWI Radio, I worked um, in Auckland, uh, my FM, when they first started, I was on air there, um, so I have a little bit of a connection into that, so uh, New Zealand First has always been supportive of EWI Radio. Well, that's great to know that you're supportive of EWI, EWI Radio, but you're happy to support... You're happy to support... Um, specific funding for uh, a, a, a dedicated Māori yeah, well, radio been... station, but not for a, a, a much more possibly important uh, um, uh, thing of, of dedicated funding for Māori health. Well, Iwi Radio have been given, um, they, they receive their frequencies, so it's not for a political party to remo remove their frequencies. So, so we would support them, absolutely but not a, not a Maori Health Authority? No. Okay, thank you. Can we pass the Thank you to the three of you for coming out. Um, I take it from your presentations, I think I can take it as read that you're all supporters of public media. Far be it from me to suggest that 
your statement of that position has been platitudinous to some extent. But what I'd like to ask is this, show me the money. My question is this, Miles has outlined, sorry, it's axiomatic that this country is too small to produce from the normal tax base a public media system such as the Australians and the POMs have. What Miles has sketched out in terms of that targeted levy is an extremely practicable way to achieve funding of public media. What you people have been talking about is not asking the question of where the money comes from. And what I would like to hear from all of you is, do you support the idea of a targeted levy, a targeted unstealable levy that supports public broadcasting? Because I reckon the three of you together would just about get a majority in the House for that, no matter what the, what the composition of the House is at the moment. Where is the money coming from? Great question. Can, um, can I uh, uh, say um, that that, it's, uh, that we've been underfunded for many years now, and I, I um, uh, agree with uh, what uh, Miles has been saying, because otherwise you're just uh, at the whim of, of different uh, governments who don't see uh, broadcasting as a priority. Look, the reality was even with the merger, as Miles said, we were still uh, reliant on commercial revenue. You know, the, mer the merger was, uh, in, in, you know, while we were putting an extra 100 million in, weren't we, Miles? We were probably 200 million short if we, were, uh, we really wanted to do the business in terms of the merger. So the principles that um, Miles talked about is I, 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 couldn't, uh, I couldn't argue with. What I could argue with, though, is that sadly you won't see uh, us in Parliament with... Uh, Jenny Markroff and Winston Peters. So you won't uh, you won't get what you what you've asked for. Is that a yes to the levy idea? That's what I said. I support the principle of that. Absolutely, absolutely. As I've indicated in my opening remarks, the Green Party is very much open to the levy idea. I think, like, I, but I did want to push on the like while we work through that. I think. We, just, we still need to increase our revenue sources because otherwise we keep going around in circles. So it's a bit of a yes and. Um, as uh, in the introductory presentation, we have countries with comparable population who manage to have revenue streams to enable better funding for public media. And so I think um, while we work at the levy, that shouldn't stop us um, from doing what is right and better funding our public media services. I was just trying to look, uh, I recall, and I. Can I come back to you on that? Because we have had a policy in the past aligned with what you're saying, um, but I couldn't pull it up on the internet right now. Yeah. Because it was something that um, a previous spokesperson had, had discussed, so I'll, I'll come back to you on it, that. It was in New Zealand First um, policy a couple of elections ago. Correct. Yeah. Jenny, before can my I, time. I've, got, I think I've got here, I think, the policy you might be referring to which is introduce a requirement for international streamers like Netflix and other international platforms with significant New Zealand subscriptions to contribute to the New Zealand pr production industry by commissioning local content production. Was that the bit you were referring to? Correct, yes. Yeah, I didn't have it to actually be able to articulate it properly, but thank you for that. Back and then we'll pick up some Zoom questions. One of the countries that has successfully done this is Finland, which uh, since 2013 went off the licence fee and replaced it with a percentage uh, that both PAYE uh, paid, which was 0.32 or something, and businesses 0.6 something. But they got 600 million euro from that and uh, they maintained the ability of uh, bias or prevented bias by having a cross-party commission that met uh, regularly every year. Um, my question is um, uh, to you, Willie, and uh, anyone who wants to grasp this, because I'm not convinced that if Melissa Lee came in here that she would run out. She's convinced herself that somehow um, a commercial is the only way to go. Uh, anything which is uh, overfunded publicly is going to be pro-government and therefore bad. Uh, and she seemed to run the, uh, if it's not broke, we won't fix it, sort of line, and no one challenged her. 
especially with the sort of uh, submission that I made uh, for Finland and other countries who have successfully made this. So um, I'm in favour of the diversity of... Uh, that you spoke about uh, the diversity of um, uh, candidates uh, because other countries that have uh, also funded it have had a problem with that diversity. So my question is, um, who's going to make the argument for the funding that we can afford as a country of five million? I think that question, and, and I think that it's incumbent on people like myself to put those arguments up. I, I have to say I haven't. Been in that, I mean, you know, like I took over this 16 or 18 months ago, but really in terms of the changes I've got with broadcasting, I think they've probably all come in in the last seven months, seven or eight months, in terms of what I was talking about earlier. But, um, and it's incumbent on people like myself, Ricardo, Jenny, to, to actually uh, look at a new strategy uh, in terms of that funding because governments never have enough. Uh, and ne don't see it as a, they don't see how important, uh, I shouldn't say that, should I? But I should say, particularly national governments, but, but, but and our governments has seen it as incredibly important, but other priorities come to the table. And you know, we've been in a cost of living crisis, so I understood why we, why we walked away from the merge and obviously supported that. But that being the case, there's always gonna be cost of living crises, so we have to come up with a new type of strategy. That's why yeah, ring fencing to what and Miles is saying. And what, and what you're saying tonight. Ring fencing and a charter. Yeah, and I think you're just, you're making another argument for the levy, right? And I think, I, I totally hear you around the taking the partisan politics away from funding public media. Completely agree on the sentiment there. I think we'll have to sit down and work together on that. I think the other component that you were mentioning in your, in your remarks around, um, I guess, how politicians engage in our comments in relationship to public media, commercial media, and some people having a bias. I think we're all incumbent on also as politicians being responsible in how we talk about media to the public. And um, sorry, just to remark on, I guess, the Q&A interview that Winston Peters had. I think like we have a responsibility to also um, not diminish that trust on media, whether it's commercial or public. And so I think it's, it's, it's both, right? It's about making sure that we have a, sec secure that long-term funding, take the partisan politics away from it, but also on a day-to-day -day basis to also be really responsible and peace around that. I really like uh, what Chris Trotter wrote today, uh, that it's the media's job to elicit information from politicians, not to prosecute them. On that note, uh, to um, sustain a diverse news and media ecosystem as it's transitioning to digital, because that's the biggest financial challenge it's got, uh, greater efficiencies and value for money for the taxpayer really is at the forefront of New Zealand First policy at the moment as we try to get back in the black. We will need to maintain plurality as well uh, as editorial independence while we do this. And uh, that's going to really require collaboration right across our range of public media outlets. And we've got a couple of policies uh, that will speak to that, mandating that RNZ shares more of its content, technology, its uh, training, all of those sorts of things across with Ewe Radio with Access Radio, so it's the taxpayer not paying twice or thrice. And TVNZ would mandate them to do that as well across the multimedia, uh, as well as um, uh, other, other ways in which uh, they can support with shared services, facilities, content training, staff development, technical services, infrastructure as well. And um, I think that's really important that while we are in this position, let's make some efficiencies in our public media as well. Because I think there, there are some shared, and I know uh, RNZ, for example, does share its content. Um, so I think we just need to take that a little step further. Yeah, I think also the collaborations are really important, eh? You know, like we do some fantastic things in terms of Māori media, in terms of Pacifica media. We've got some great broadcasters, you know, like Dale Husband, and, Julian Wilcox, you know, Moana, you know, Mahi. A lot of these broadcasters are not seen enough in mainstream. 
and, and, and you could really, um, uh, they could really make a contrib contribution. And what, some of the funding that we gave to RNZ too, it's not just, uh, it's about tapping into these partnerships and these collaborations. So totally agree with Jenny there. I just don't agree with what she said at the start about Chris Trotter because I think it's incumbent on politicians to answer questions too. <laughs> I'd just like to um, explain one of the little um, projects I worked on when I was in Parliament. That was with Mihi Forbes. She was funded by New Zealand On Air, along with Annabelle Lee Mather, to make the New Zealand Wars series. And one of the things that we thought would be really important, and this is getting, you know, double bang for your buck, is that RNZ, which is wanting more content and education, which needs stories of our history, for that documentary, which was around $500,000 per 30-minute episode, for that, that content then to be used in the classroom, to go up on RNZ's website, so that, so that we're really sharing um, and giving value to our taxpayer. I think that's really important, that kind of collaboration. Thanks, Matt. Okay, uh, we're going to have yeah, question questions here. From, uh, from our Zoom. Hold on, Thank one you. here. On question the on the floor. Hi. Oh, sorry. I think we should. We've got 75 people out there in the Zoom who are part of this meeting. And they include, uh, you'd be interested to know, some very senior industry people and media commentators. I'm not going to name them unless they want to name themselves by questions or comments. But we've got about three or at least already. So if we could start with Gavin Ever Ellis's question to each party. Would you consider a special tax status for news media beyond making subscription tax deductible to recognise their public interest journalism, and would you consider tax-free status? That's something that I have to take to our policy team, but um, it certainly is something that is worth the consideration. Yeah, equally, we don't have an established policy on that specifics, but I think it's something worth exploring. We've um, talked about it, and uh, um, at the moment, uh, the answer would be no. It's just to be, a, but it has been spoken about and uh, um, and explored. So, uh, but uh, understand where who was that from, Gavin? That was from Gavin Ellis. Yeah, and un understand where Gavin's coming from, um, and and it's been looked at, but uh, it's, it's uh, not on the table at the moment. Cool. So I've, I've got a few, yeah, one or two more. Um, from Mark Harvey, to each party, what is your position on allowing for free speech to the degree that it can be hate speech and discriminatory in the media? I, I, I certainly believe in free. We certainly believe in free speech, uh, and uh, um, it's all look. It's going to be part of as part of a review right now. The point is, and I think a lot of our communities are saying, and I'm and if I'm to listen, if I'm if I'm being fair, I have to listen to some of our communities. It's about how far does the free speech go. That's, that's what some of our communities are saying. I, I, I'm a little bit different. I suppose I came from, you know, broadcasting background, union background. Don't, it doesn't worry me what anyone says. But, but communities have approached me about, you know, should we, putting, should we be putting lines in the sand? Now, I can be very clear on this. There's no, um, there's no uh, strategy from us right now in terms of broadcasting to limit that. But it is being discussed that, particularly with the, the huge influences and the disinformation that's going online, you know, we, we may have to come up with something in terms of a response, uh, and that's all part of what we're doing in terms of reviews at the moment. So while obviously supporting free speech 100%, let's, let's not kid ourselves that sometimes it gets out of hand and sometimes people get hurt. And I think it goes beyond just people getting hurt, right? It's the risk of incitement of violence that can occur when um, hate speech does end up happening in, in media spaces. Um, I think there's two parts to this. One of them is that 
I think I go back to, well, A, they need to have progressed the hate speech legislation and to have done it more thoroughly, but B, there's also, I think this is another case for why decent, sustainable funding for public media is important, because otherwise, while I know that there's commercial media um, uh, companies that are trying to do the best to have a diversity of voices and to kind of push back against some of the rhetoric and, and have other groups that are affected by hate speech represented, the reality is that also, when public media isn't funding, it's the people with the most resources that then have the loudest voices, and if those loudest voices are propagating hate speech, that then creates a void for other communities to have a say. And so I think the, the panacea to the risk of social cohesion by the status quo is actually funding public media adequately so that we actually have that that counter voice to potentially a growing, um, growing attacks in uh, media against rainbow rainbow Māori um, and, and migrant minority groups. And so I think this is the key role of having a diversity of stories being told that public media can enable. Uh, I think that it's interesting to note that we, there is certainly a decline of trust uh, in our media. 60%, according to the Auckland University study, said people, 60% don't trust the media. 70%, which is even more alarming, uh, are avoiding the news. They're avoiding the media. So if they're not going to our mainstream media, then they're going somewhere else to get their information. And it's really important, I believe, that we need to give agency to all voices. And when you shut down voices, when you cancel them, then it's like a pot boiling on the stove with the lid on. What's going to happen? The lid will blow off. So it's important that we are able to as a society, listen to other people's opinion, not judge them, not cancel them, not tell them they're cookers or nutters and they're down a rabbit hole. Actually, we need to bring back a bit more humanity and tolerance into our dialogue with each other. Because I think, well, A, I'm not really clear on what you mean by cancelling, because I, I think actually um, there is already a diversity of views um, within the median landscape, but B, I think I would draw a, a difference between this is why we have hate speech legislation, right? I think there is something about also having a firm line when groups are actively inciting violence against minority groups. And, and sometimes that inciting violence also need to come from just the literal physical threats. It's about the constant dehumanization, mocking, and erasing of communities. And so I think part of us having a human conversation is being able to center the voices who are affected by that violence. And you know, I really do wish Melissa Lee was here because you know, when we have MPs who are constantly attacking Maori media and pitting against, for example, migrant um, community media, that is a form of enabling anti-Maori sentiment to seep through and for the trust, you know, to what Jenny was talking about, the trust in media declining, the trust in media declines when politicians actively are attacking Maori media outlets. Thanks very much, Com very complex issue. Um, we'll move along, we're gonna get one more Zoom question and then we'll come back to the floor here in the library. Thanks, Peter. Um, this one's from Matt. Um, there's a bit of a preamble and then a question. In 1986, there was a Royal Commission on Broadcasting and Related Telecommunications which examined the potential future of RNZ and TVNZ, et cetera. It was largely ignored in favor of deregulation and New Zealand on air. In the light of big tech's disruption of the media sector, now would be a good time to revisit the 1986 commission. The Leveson inquiry in the UK, which was held in the wake of the Hatgate scandal, and the Franken Finkelstein inquiry in Australia probed Rupert Mur Murdoch's dominance. A royal commission building on the above could take the partisan politics out of media reform. So to the panelists, would you consider a royal commission into NZ's media sector as outlined above? Uh, no. <laughs> as Express, I would need to kind of have a further conversation, but at this point we don't have a policy, so it would be a no. New Zealand first policy is a Royal Commission of Inquiry into Media Bias and Manipulation in New Zealand. 
Okay, back to the floor. I believe there's a gentleman Thanks a here waiting Cheers. for the question. Oh, look, I, I, I welcome the Libby conversation. I think it is a, a, a great conversation to have and one that uh, in the production community be uh, very thankful to hear about. But I do also wonder, and, and specifically around all our local broadcasters, there are no quotas. So the Broadcasting Act doesn't dictate that there is any content required from any of our broadcasters apart from a moral obliga obligation uh, to make local content. Should we change that, and I'm interested in your opinion on that, should we change that and get local quotas within our Broadcasting Act, which would then also cause any operator to come into New Zealand, be it a Netflix or an Apple or a Disney, to also abide by those laws? I mean, it's an idea worth exploring, and what it reminds me of is the conversation I'd be having with um, actress guilds around even the requirement to kind of have local people also leading some of those media productions when people come here to produce um, content. And so, yeah, it's, I think, something worth exploring. Um, I wouldn't be able to commit to any specifics, but um, I think in terms of your point around how do we ensure there's enough local content, um, I think that could be something. Well, at any time, TV3 or Sky could get out of making local content. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. Look, we're doing the reshape of the Broadcasting Act right now. I mean, it's not fit for purpose. We were set up in 1989. So uh, we didn't even have the internet in 1989. So I think those types of ideas, and we, it, we, it's all going to be done, I think, uh, over the next 12 months in terms of the whole review. And it needs to encapsulate ideas like that. You know, we have to, it has to get fit for purpose, recognise what's happening now in terms of local content, in terms of groups who are not being served, in terms of deaf people, in terms of, uh, you know, our, our disability uh, uh, um, sector. And I think the Broadcasting Act will be reshaped, revamped, and be fit for purpose and take into account exactly what you're saying. Thanks, Wally. I, I agree with um, Minister Jackson about the, the reshape of the Broadcasting Act and New Zealand First would like it to be called the Public Media Act and bring those other entities into it as well under that umbrella. Um, just on a note on, on that content, something that I am a bit concerned about is this is, you know, when the Film Commission funds something, it ends up on Netflix but it doesn't come back to New Zealand for New Zealand audience screening for a number of years and there's a, there's a, a, a program called Six Days, or a show called, not a show, a, 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 it's a documentary. Um, and that's taken six years for it to finally be available for New Zealand audience. So it was, that's, that's not right. We've, if we're funding content, we want to see it immediately, not have it up, up in the Northern Hemisphere. Can I just add on the question around quotas? Quotas are actually legal in New Zealand. We're not allowed them through the, the free trade agreement, which is GATT which I mentioned in the speech. So if you wanted a quota, you let to go back and change GATT. So that's why I was mentioning the other solution, which is the, um, the levy and, uh, you know, the, the uh, limit on, or the, the two percent, the Danish model, which is 2% on all revenue, which is then funneled back into our local production. Because if Netflix, for example, fund programmes, they're going to play them as well. Right, so if they're funding 5% of their revenue goes to New Zealand Productions, then all those programmes will go onto Netflix and we'll see them. So it's, an, it's a way around the quota without having to change GAT, which is impossible, I would say. There used to be an argument in, in commercial radio a number of years ago which was about playing New Zealand music. There should be a quota on our local radio stations. Um, and that was, you know, the argument was, oh, we don't have enough good music. New Zealanders aren't producing enough good music that we can play on our CHR radio stations or whatever. Yes, absolutely. So, so, you know, we don't have that issue now. We do make extremely good content and we should all be very proud of it. Thanks very much. Now, there's a question at the front and then a question, at, well, two questions at the back. And then we'll go back to Zoom. If the lady in the brightest the coat in the room. Right, the first woman to ask a question tonight. Um, However, um, right, so the elephant in the room, it seems to me, as someone, I was a journalist for 20 years, and uh, then I'm, I trained as a lawyer, and now I work as a lawyer in media, and I uh, teach media law, and I teach media law to journalists and to lawyers. So that's very interesting, because I always say to both groups, what's your source of news? And they don't say The Herald. They don't say Radio New Zealand. 
then, then this is the future, right? This is the future. They say TikTok. They, you know, it, it, mm -hmm. yeah. And if they want to, 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 to Google something, they don't go to Google. You know, so to me, the elephant in the room here is also the AI generative. We haven't talked about this. We haven't talked about ChatGPT and, and BARD and what's the other one? Bing Chat? Chat Bing? Bing Chat. The devil way around. Anyway, they are still an opportunity to steal journalism in this country, which is what I saw when I was a journalist for 20 years. I'm, just, I'm so sick of having my stuff stolen. And this is another opportunity for it to be stolen, and yet none of the talking tonight seems to address this is the next generation. It's not Radio New Zealand and talking about the Herald. It's talking about that. And I want to know how you're going to address that, because that is the absolute future for us. And that is, uh, those tech companies are going to keep stealing our content. They are going to do it from journalists. And it's going to turn journalists off being journalists. It's going to take away their income. And that's been the big problem. That's why older, older more experienced journalists walk away, because they can't live the way the system's set up much as I personally do support a, you know, a tax or a levy, I think that would be great. Would you like to respond? Thank you for that. Um, I think as I got introduced as a projectionist at the beginning and um, my job was actually replaced by, by a literal machine. <laughs> so I kind of hear you there. And I do think we're not, like, as legislators, I think we're slow to the game of kind of thinking how artificial intelligence will impact jobs, how it will impact other things. So I think we should be considering that. There's, a, and I think better funding for public media can help protect jobs in that space as well and evolve, evolve that kind of thing, that changing game as well, as well as protecting our tertiary education institutions that actually create the pipeline of people who go into that workforce. But I think um, in terms of whether we need to pay more attention into how we protect our industry from emerging technologies that ultimately will exist more within the commercial realm um, is something that we should absolutely keep a keen eye on as well. It's the intellectual property. Yeah. We're not, we're not protecting intellectual yeah. property. And so you've, you, that's what you've really got to be looking at. That's good. You've got to really address you know, how we're going to do it. And, and be, emerging, technologies could, emerging technologies could also end up um, putting and jeopardizing jobs in, in newsrooms as well. And I think that's, that's it's, it's, I take your point, it's intellectual property and it's also about having a just transition as emerging technologies come in. As a legisl I wouldn't be able to give you an answer in terms of how we tackle AI if you came to have a conversation on that, but all I'm saying is I'm acknowledging that as legislators, we're slow to the game of responding to those emerging technologies. Well, look, journalists are inherently, uh, oh, I was just saying that journalists are inherently lazy in some respects, and so if an AI bot can knock together some figures and throw out a graph. Great, that leaves you time to do the personal one-to-one -one questioning of people, of politicians, for example. Yeah. You know, but you've got to find a way to, to make it work. Yeah, Yeah. no, I totally see what you're saying, but um, uh, in terms of AI, it'll all be part of the whole broadcasting uh, review in terms of what's happening with the Broadcasting Act because it's, a, again, something new that's come onto the scene. Look, I don't apologise as a government for focusing on what hasn't been focused on properly for the last 20 years, which is our national, um, uh, which is our national uh, public providers. You know, the, we're talking about RNZ, we're talking about TVNZ. I know people will say, well, why are you doing that? Because all the young ones, are do, you know, they're on the internet. Well, if we don't, then who does? You see? If we don't, who does? It's like Māori, you know, I, was, I chaired Māori Radio, Māori Media for 10, 12 years. You know, we, we didn't, we didn't, I was the chairman of 21 stations. I was the chairman of Māori Television for all our communities. I was the electoral college chair. They told us no one was watching us. They told us no one was listening to us. So what the hell were we doing supporting this? You see? We support it because the culture is so important. We support it because the language is so important. And, and, and it deserved investment, and it deserves investment today. And those are our priorities. And in terms of RNZ and TVNZ, you know, it's, they're still trusted sources, uh, and, and, and those types of entities are such an integral part of every other developed nation who've had the proper investment. <laughs> but we, we, ha we haven't given the proper investment. So, you know, now's the time for us to do that. And what you're talking about is really important too, and we'll encapsulate that in the broadcasting app review. But we've got to, you know, we've got to look after what's in front of us to start off with, or no one else will. Just, just really 
sort of very briefly, it's, that's about exerting our own sovereignty over our own content that we're producing. So I just acknowledge that. Um, and obviously the work that the minister is doing, um, I haven't seen what that looks like. So certainly I'm sure after yeah, you know, your comment today, that'll certainly be, he'll make sure that's focused on that. And I'd like to see what that looks like most definitely. Thank you. And then another question at the back, and then maybe we'll see if there's more Zoom questions. Um, hi, um, my name's Shemina Smith, and I work for a tech policy think tank called Brainbox. Um, this is a question for all of um, the panelists. What's, uh, do you believe that media literacy is important? And if so, what's your perspective on the government's role in supporting media literacy initiatives? Nobody's grabbing the mic. It is important. Um, in terms of how we strengthen it, I think it needs probably a range of interventions. Um, I think some of it can be around making sure that our education institutions are fit for purpose to kind of, A, so for example, even just thinking our tertiary education institutions actually um, being resources that we can have not just the courses that are thought of as kind of commercially viable, and I think that's kind of part of the, the conversations we've been having. But I absolutely think that as per the, one of the previous questions around emerging technologies and channels in which news and information is distributed, um, media literacy is becoming more and more of an issue because then how people access the news can be a huge challenge, and I think that the conversation we will need to be having with social media giants around, for example, how we ensure that um, information is presented in a way that honors the, the legitimacy of the sources will, will continue being critical um, because in a kind of low media literacy landscape, the, the ability to, 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 to have that information um, by the public is now being compromised. So. Will you, Jenny, did you have a no, comment? I support uh, what you're talking about. And again, it's part of everything, uh, the whole, all the different new developments in terms of what's happened with the media. You know, AI, you name it, right across uh, the spectrum. And, and so I support it, and, and it's being reviewed right now along with everything else uh, that's come to the table. I mean, I think we, we can all agree that we have really good, strong regulation around our traditional media um, and social media, where a lot of people are getting their news and information. It's pretty much the Wild West, and it's there in that space that we need to put our minds as to what needs to happen there. Okay, new sheriff is needed. The, now, there was a question at the back and then the lady at the front. Hey guys, um, I've got a couple of questions about the screen production rebate. The ACT Party wants to scrap the international and the domestic rebates, uh, even though multiple studies have demonstrated that the return on investment is upwards of 600%. Will everyday New Zealanders be better off if those rebates are scrapped? And secondly, is our international rebate at 20% competitive enough? We don't have policy on that, but the only comment I'd really make is this is the hidden right-wing agenda we're seeing in play, and that's the austerity that will come through if ACT has too much power. Yeah, yeah well, I support what you're saying. We, you know, it's, it's a bit of a right-wing agenda going on there in terms of, of that, and I think we're all aware of it. I think there is a lot that we can do to better support domestic productions, getting rid of the rebates is not one of those. Okay, thank you very much. There was a question at the front. No, a question at oh, the just front, front first. Really quick one. Um, Jenny, you said you wanted to abolish the Broadcasting Standards Authority. What was the reason for that and what would the change um, uh, benefit? So, so it's to set up a media ombudsman 
and the Broadcasting Standards Authority would fall in or change and come in under the office. It's really to give that office way more teeth. Okay, thanks, Jenny. And a question at the front. Uh, kia ora koutou. You made the comments at the beginning of the session, which I totally agree with, about the importance of our media reflecting our identity and representing us. It's inarguable. You also talked about social cohesion and the importance of the media, inarguable. The thing that's missing, it seems to me, is about an informed public, because a strong democracy relies completely on an informed public. My question to you is how well do you think, at the moment, the media is delivering current affairs as opposed to news? Mm -hmm. I mean, the role of the fourth estate uh, is to to not only show us the trajectory of our flight as a nation, but also the tenor of it. And I don't believe we're totally seeing that at the moment. Um, I think there is, there's been, a, there's been a dumbing down of our media. Um, and I think we all agree with that. And I think that's, that's the thing that's eroding our trust in the media, that's eroding our democracy, and that's something we all have to be extremely concerned about. I think, yeah, public media plays a huge role in being able to slow down and tell stories in a format that actually are not, is not always enabled in other ways. And so I think that's one, one argument for better, more secure funding. The other one actually is, it goes also back to having an informed public also comes back to, for example, the fact we don't have civic education in schools yet. And like, so therefore, when people are consuming media and they come from an education background where we don't even have civic civics, like it also means that like, we're already starting like, with a public that isn't equipped with the tools to assess the kind of media they're consuming. So this is why I think having, for example, civics in schools will also enrich how the public engages with the media content that they consume. Mm -hmm. But to your point, I, I agree with Jenny that we, can, we should be doing more to enable um, different types of formats that create spaces for also education and understanding. Uh, kia ora. I, I, th I, I agree with uh, Jenny in parts, you know, although I, I think Jack Tame's a fantastic interview. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> I think he's probably the best I've seen, actually. And, and, and look, I've had a, the old uh, dig dong with, with Jack, but, uh, oh, brilliant, brilliant interview. And uh, I, I, I do think, um, you know, in terms of uh, what Jenny's saying, though, is I, I think we can do a bit, I think we can do a bit better. I do, I think we can do a bit better. Oh, yeah, no, uh, no doubt about it, but there is, we've got some real talent uh, uh, amongst them. I mean, you know, I'm talking about Jack, I'm, you know, I mean, who, who could argue with how good John Campbell is? I mean, you know, you're talking brilliant, uh, brilliant journalists, you know. Uh, um, and if you go across, uh, you know, from our Māori perspective, people like Mahi Forbes in there, you know, you get some exceptional um, uh, broadcast, Julian Wilcox, you know. Uh, um, it's really, uh, so I go across the spectrum, and I think one of the problems we have is that we, our current affairs um, um, programs are stuck in ghettoised times. You know, when, when you know, you ever, you ever think about that and get always in the like, early morning on a Sunday, on, been like that for years and years and years, you know? And so we have to actually get, get to a point, you know, well, that's right, I had a TV show many years ago, about, but, but it was also not in the greatest of times. And I think we have to value our current affairs uh, shows, prioritise them, get them, let's get, let's get, that's what's all part of a, a revamp in terms of pub public media. It's, that's how I look at it, and 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 and, and, and with its some outstanding, um, as I said, Maori uh, broadcasters who aren't, uh, you know, who could be right at the centre of a lot of things. Look, I was been a, I've supported RNZ, and I will continue to as a broadcasting minister. But I have to remind them we haven't had one Maori broadcaster in the from the start in the last 100 years 
in a prime time position on RNZ. So we could do better. Oh, I just wanted to add to that. We wanted one. New Zealand First wanted to put a referendum at this election to have an immediate four-year term. Uh, but I'd just like to come back to, to that problem that we had, have had with New Zealand On Air. At a, probably eight, ten years ago, they stopped wanting to fund current affairs. They stopped wanting to fund documentaries because they were wanting to dabble here, there and everywhere. So if we don't have the funder putting money into current affairs programmes and uh, those kinds of in documentaries, then we're not going to have these stories told. But if you still get the commitment from the broadcaster... I think the, the, the gentleman probably wasn't on the mic, but he's making an important point that New Zealand on Air can only fund content when it has a guarantee of distribution. And one of the big problems that a lot of independent producers come across, both Māori and Pākehā, is that when you've got a good idea for a programme and you take it to the broadcasters, they're only interested in, in accepting it and scheduling it if it will rate. So there was so a lot of content there, that there was a, There was a programme of Māori uh, documentaries that were on Māori television. Uh, they received a, a notice from New Zealand on air said, actually, we're cutting that. Mm. They, were, they were funding 15 documentaries a year. I think I've, I'd have to check my number on that. And they were told by New Zealand on air, sorry, we're not doing that programme anymore. Yep. We're, uh, we're... Sorry, did you want to have a comment, Ricardo? No, no, no. So just realised the gentleman was blocking <laughs> the, uh, the We're really up for time, unfortunately. Um, so I think there's probably time for maybe one or possibly two very last questions. Um, Thanks, Peter. David, do you want to go? Yeah, I mean... My comment and question follows from what you were saying, and, and it does reflect my experience as a, as a producer. I'm on record uh, as saying that I think in our current structure, uh, New Zealand on air is the best thing we've got in terms of um, broadcasting media. Uh, the, the funding agencies with their limited funding, and I include Film Commission and Tamanga Paho in that, do a pretty good job. And the levy will help. It'll increase the amount of money available. But the fact is, it's not enough, because the settings are wrong. The settings are skewed towards commercial imperatives. They're not skewed towards public media, even though New Zealand On Air is there to fund public media. Um, better, better public media I'm just going to be a minute or two more, Peter, I'm sorry. Better Public Media did a survey uh, about a year ago in which over 70% or of respondents agreed that RNZ and TVNZ should operate independently of commercial pressures. TVNZ, well, RNZ operates in, independently of commercial pressures, but TVNZ is a commercial beast. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, and, and the decisions it makes regarding uh, the content it chooses to run is subject to commercial decision making. That's understandable because it's commercial. Now the problem in the settings is that New Zealand On Air provides funding to content that is supported pretty much wholly by commercial platforms. Not totally, but, but, but pretty much. And it's not just that, it's, ju it's that, that the, this, is, this is the point I'm getting to. This is the bit that I'd like you to address. The platforms are required to make a contribution to the content that's funded by New Zealand On Air. In effect, they're buying the right, and I know this is a pretty bald way of putting it, they're buying the right for the public funding to be used through their commercial contribution. It's just totally wrong, and it skews the system. Now, I want to acknowledge that the Greens are a little bit seeking to address this in their policy by suggesting that we permit New Zealand On Air to adjust the broadcaster's contribution. Ricardo, it's not equity. It's only, it's, they, it was called a licence fee, traditionally, to lower, 
to a lower level in specific priority genres, e.g. children's content, in order to directly contribute to genre audience priority. Why just for certain genres? Why don't we get rid of this crazy anomaly whereby broadcasters are making a, a commercial contribution, in effect, as I said, buying the right for the public to get the content they want supported, which is subject to their commercial pressures. It does not support public funding, I, okay. public, public media values, and I'd really like to hear what you've each got to say about that. Comments from the panel? Oh, yeah. No, I... Um I don't uh, disagree too much with what you're saying. Uh, I mean, uh, as a, you come in as, from my own, own position, I, you come in as a minister, and the structure's already there. And so f my position is I can't, reshape, I can't reshape the whole thing in 16 to 18 months. You can only make the most of what you've got in front of you. So you're, it's all, um, uh, you know, so, so, so the whole model... It, it, it is, as you know, with the merger, we were, what, what were we, 200 million short a year? 200 million short a year. I mean, what you're talking about is the absolute ideal, and, and, um, and, and, and I support the principle of what you're talking about, but it's about trying to, you know, I gotta, you got to actually get that, you got to change the, the philosophy of governments, don't you, who, want a, who absolutely support a, a public media um, uh, philosophy, but then that commercial side comes into it, and it almost becomes impossible to manage. It almost becomes impossible to manage, and that's where the, we had critics in terms of the mergers that we wanted to do two things, weren't we? You know, RNZ, you 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 don't uh, you don't have to make any money, but TVNZ, you'll make the money. That was the that was the merger, wasn't it? And we're coming together as one entity, and and. And we wanted to give it a go, but uh, if you really want to do it properly, you're, you're talking about the, the absolute ideal model, which I think is going to take some time because, you know, you've you got to convince a few people that uh, that should be the way. And some, some, some will say that, that that's just, you know, that's just too puritanical. You know, look, I come into a system, mate. I come into a system, I came from a Māori party. Right, I was the leader of a Maori party, and come into a system and realise that you're just going to have to take bits and pieces here because you're not going to get the absolute pure form that you want. You're not going to get the absolute funding that you want. So you've got to grab what you can and do the best within the system, and that's what we're trying to do. That's what I'm trying to do. But I understand where you're coming from and support the principle. And I think what you've described is decades of austerity when it comes to funding public media, right? And that's where we've landed in terms of what you've described. So on top of thing to steer things around, it's about A, having secure funding, B, then looking at the systemic stuff that the minister was talking about. So in principle, yeah, like agree with the sentiments, it's about, but I think securing decent long-term funding for public media is, in my view, the first step towards then having those more systemic conversations you're describing. Yeah. Jenny, did you have a comment? Just very briefly, I think, you know, where the country is faced with the fiscal challenges before it, this is not something that um, New Zealand First would be looking at at this time. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, maybe we can just stretch things and we'll have one last very quick question from Zoom. Cool, thank you. Um, this is from oh, Comp Lid. I'm not sure, is there, oh sorry, here we go, Gerard Liddell. Um, he says, primarily we need public broadcasting to coordinate our nation's discussions. We need to separate disinformation from hate speech. Media Watch, Media Watch reports the systemic disinformation promulgated by the elements of NZME and other outlets. When statements are made that lack any justification and are in conflict with, conflict with accepted evidence, then public media need a coordinated response. This does, not, this does not conflict with the freedom to make statements, but when they can offer no basis for the, their statements, then we should limit their reiteration and amplification until new grounds are advanced. Will you support a public broadcaster that provides a forum for our national dialogues? National dialogue. 
Any responses? I mean, if, if, I mean, if I can extrapolate from the comment, maybe, to give it a, a focus, because we, we do have to wrap up fairly soon. I mean, would, would, do you see public media as having a, a, a key fact-checking function? Of course, yeah. And I think it's, that's a huge role of public media, in fact. Yeah. Fact-checking, but also ensuring uh, that there's a whole lot less opinion, because we know opinion is cheap, uh, it's cheap labour. Um, and oh, free labour in many cases. That's right. Um, yeah. So, so I think you know. I think there's a lot more we could do to ensure that we have a media that we can trust. Okay. Really? And just finally, I think being asked basic figures in TV shows isn't an opinion. Just FYI. <laughs> yeah, I um, you got no problem with fact checking and and whatnot. And I have no problem with opinions too. I suppose it just depends whose opinion <laughs> it is. <laughs> Right. There's a certain bloke on ZB, I don't know if I want to hear his opinion too much, but he's so popular it isn't funny, isn't it? So, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, all subjective, I suppose. Anyway, kia ora, everyone. Thanks, uh, thanks very much. Been, okay. a, been a privilege. So we have to bring things to a close, unfortunately, but a huge thank you to Honourable Willie Jackson, Ricardo Menendez-March and Jenny Marcroft for taking the time to come and talk to us. Very, very much appreciate your presence and your wisdom. Um, and thanks to everyone in the audience, both here in Newland uh, Community Centre and indeed on Zoom. Uh, so thank you very much all. And there's uh, tea and biscuits and other snacks at the back if you're thus inclined. Thank you very much indeed. That was great. <laughs>